Welcome to NGP University. I'm Pastor Brent Jones. We're so glad you joined us for this uh, time of learning the Word of God. One of the things that is uh, gives people a lot of trouble in Christianity is knowing the will of God or finding the will of God. And so I wanted to help simplify something that can be va vague and mysterious and people think they have to divine it or get a word. But I want you to understand from the scripture, God wants you to know the will of God. And it is very simple. In Ephesians 5, 17 through 18, it says, Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we want to know and do God's will, but many Christians struggle to hear God's voice and to know His will. They find the whole process frustrating, vague, and they're left feeling spiritually paralyzed. Could it be that the problem does not lie with God's silence, nor our inability to hear what God is saying, but with our conception of God's will and the particular methods we use of trying to discern it? Could it be that our conception of God's will and hearing His voice is not taught in the Bible? Perhaps we have overcomplicated and over-spiritualized the will of God. Many Christians think God's will for their life is both extensive and detailed. In addition to God's general will that we develop our moral character, He also has a more specific will for us concerning our education, our vocation, our residency, our spouse, where we congregate and other matters big and small. So our job is to, number one, discern God's will in these matters using various methods such as peace in our heart, open and closed doors, unbidden thoughts, impressions, signs, and fleeces. That's what a lot of people think. That's what a lot of people think. And number two, to make choices that match God's will. The process is similar to navigating. Here's how people think about it. God chooses our destination and the route we should take to get there. And our job is merely to discover the map and follow it turn by turn. This sounds reasonable, perhaps even comforting, but is it biblical? I assume so until I was forced to look at the Scripture more carefully. Now I'm convinced that this understanding of the will of God, while well-intentioned, errs in its assumptions about the extent of God's will and the methods for discerning it. So let's ask a question. How extensive is God's will? Does God have a will for our life? Of course. The question is, how extensive and detailed is that will? Does it extend to our choice of residence, where we live, our career, our employer, our spouse, etc., etc.? Or is it more general in nature, focused primarily on our character and moral development? The biblical data leads me to conclude it is the latter. For this is the will of God, that you should be consecrated, separated, and set apart for pure and holy living, that you should abstain and shrink from all sexual vice. It's pretty clear. The will of God is for us to be chaste. So the will of God is clear from 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3, that we should abstain and shrink from sexual vice and be dedicated to God for holy living. It's also clear, thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances may be. Be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.18. So be holy and separated from sexual sin and to make uh, your petitions known. That's the will of God. For it is God's will and intention that by doing right, your good and honest life should silence or muzzle or gag the ignorant charges and ill-informed criticisms of foolish people. He says, live as free people, yet without employing your freedom as a pretext for wickedness, but live at all times as servants unto God, according to 1 Peter 2.13. God's will is more akin to a compass than a road map. He is more concerned with the kind of person we are and the moral choices we make than He is with our individual life choices. 
His will is that we become a certain kind of person, not that we necessarily go to this college or marry this person or live in a certain city. So long as we're becoming more like Christ and using the giftings God has endowed us with for His glory and the furtherance of His kingdom, we can be confident that we're in the will of God. For example, when it comes to marriage, God wills that our spouse be of the opposite of sex, be a Christian who has similar values and morals. God hasn't chosen the one for us, but He gives us options. That's why the Scripture says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Not he who finds the wife God has destined for him fulfills the will of God. Paul did not admonish single Christians to pray for God to show them who to marry, but rather to gauge their level of self-control in abstaining from sex, right? So he tells us it's your choice. Think about it. If God chose your spouse and it didn't work out, then you would blame God. God gives you some principles and guidelines for choosing a great spouse, but you have to make the decision. When it comes to ministry, we don't need to have a calling experience from God. Calling happens, and in the Bible it often speaks of salvation, such as Acts 2.39, Romans 11, 29, 1 Corinthians 1, 26. While we do see a few people being specifically commissioned by God for ministry, such as Moses, Jeremiah, and Paul, this is not the norm. And there is no expectation set by the Scripture that everyone called to ministry will have a similar supernatural experience. Instead, we're told in 1 Timothy 3, 1, that someone should aspire to the office of overseer, and if he does, he desires a noble task. Paul instructed Timothy and Titus to look for men who fulfill certain character traits and possess certain abilities and then appoint them as overseers. No calling experience was required. God distributes ministry through gifting, not calling. God's will is that we exercise the giftings He has given us for the growth of His kingdom and the edification of the body of Christ. How we exercise these giftings matters more, how we exercise His giftings matters more than where we exercise them. To find our ministry, we simply need to look at what we desire to do for God, right? What is it that we have a passion for? The Bible says this, this saying is true and irrefutable. If any man eagerly seeks the office of bishop, he desires an excellent task, according to 1 Timothy 3.1. Realize what we're gifted to do, what we have a passion and what we're gifted to do. Having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. He whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. He who teaches to teaching. He exhorts or encourages to exhortation. He who contributes, let him do it in simplicity and liberality. He who gives aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. He who does acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness and joyful eagerness, according to Romans 12, 6 through 8. Paul says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's free grace which was bestowed on me by the exercise, the working and all of its effectiveness of His power, according to Ephesians 3, 7. We can expect that our giftings will be recognized and confirmed by other Christian leaders. Paul tells Timothy, do not neglect the gift which is in you, which was directly imparted to you by the Holy Spirit by prophetic utterance when the elders laid their hands upon you at your ordination, 1 Timothy 4 and 14. So how do we discover God's will? Should we seek the will of God? Yes, but we should not do so using, uh, but we should do so using biblical methods. Unfortunately, most methods used for discerning the will of God are not found in Scripture. Let me give you some examples. 
People are told to look for the will of God in our unbidden thoughts, things that just pop into our mind, or our feelings. Do you have peace in your heart about the decision? Or impressions such as a still small voice, or a sign, or a song, or a license plate, okay? These methods are neither taught nor modeled in the Scripture. While some of the terms are found in Scripture, they mean something very different. For example, being led of the Spirit refers to moral development, not hearing God's voice or obtaining personal direction from God. Having peace in my heart is based on Colossians 3.15, but the context has nothing to do with making decisions or discovering God's will. The peace that Paul is talking about is not an internal peace one feels in their heart, but an interpersonal peace among members of the body of Christ. Another example, the still small voice of 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, Elijah heard, was the soft but audible voice of God, not an intramental thought or an impression. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice but he was speaking figuratively of salvation. There is no biblical basis for a check in the Spirit. The Bible does speak of discerning of spirits in 1 Corinthians 12.10, but this is a spiritual gift that only some believers have, and it's not used to find God's will for our life. Scripture also speaks of testing the spirits. But this is a rational process that does not involve getting information directly from God. We test spirits by examining whether they are conforming to the Word of God, conforming to the behavior that God describes. There is no biblical basis whatsoever for identifying our unbidden thoughts or impressions as God's way of speaking to us. Gideon only fleeced the Lord after God revealed His will in Joshua 6, 36-40. Fleecing the Lord was evidence of Gideon's lack of faith. Also, confirmations appear in the context of two or three witnesses. But none of these contexts have anything to do with finding God's will. It is a legal principle. Paul so also speaks of confirming people in their faith. But again, this has nothing to do with getting special direction from God. Scripture does speak of open doors and closed doors, but these were viewed as opportunities that may or may not be taken advantage of, not divine mandates. God has clearly revealed His will for our lives within the pages of the 66 books of the Bible. You don't need anything in addition to the Word of God to do the will of God. So if you want to know God's will, look, look for a verse of Scripture rather than a sign or a feeling or an impression. Read the Bible and apply its moral principles to your life in wisdom. As one wise man has said, if you want to hear from God, read your Bible. If you want to hear Him audibly, read it out loud. The Bible is chalked full of examples of godly men making decisions based on wisdom rather than seeking for or waiting for a personal revelation of God. God actually commands us to seek wisdom according to James 1.5. Why? So we can make good decisions in our life. But if God has determined most of the aspects of our life and reveals His will to us, what need would we have for wisdom? Personal revelations of God's will would make wisdom unnecessary. Wisdom is given to us so we can navigate the decisions of our life within the will of God. He gives us principles and precepts and examples so that we can make wise decisions. Understand that the will of God for you is to be transformed and conformed to the images of, of His Son, Jesus Christ, for your life to be changed and used for His glory. His will does not extend to what kind of car you drive or what color house you live in. He leaves that to your discretion. It is easy to find the will of God if you just pursue and walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the Scripture says. We want you not to be 
confused about this, to be vague about this, to seeking a sign or someone to speak into your life. The will of God is for you to be transformed and changed and is to use your life and your gifts for His glory. That's the will of God. Now, go do it. We believe in you and God's going to help you. Father, we thank you for the Word of God and its guidance in this area. We ask you to guide and lead us back to its pages, back to its truth, to help us have a heart of wisdom and discern the will of God for our life so that we could be holy and separated. We would abstain from that which is unlike you, God, and that we would grow into the men and women that you know we can be, and it would bring glory to you, and it would further your kingdom. Thank you for joining us on NGP University. We'll see you next time.